right, so welcome everyone. Uh, so today's webinar is going to be about system design for technical interviews. Uh, thanks for joining. So before we get started, get into the nitty gritty about system design, let me introduce myself. So uh, my name is uh, Harsh. I am the founder of Interview Camp. If you haven't heard about Interview Camp before, we're essentially a, uh, a boot camp, an online boot camp for technical interviews. Uh, and we're self-paced, so we don't do live instruction. We have a lot of course material available online, um, and we do like live sessions with our students just for uh, just for supplemental purposes. Um, yeah, we've we have quite a bit of experience in this field. Uh, we've been running for uh, three years now, and we've you know we've placed candidates into all these top companies. So we have some experience and data points about system design interviews. Uh, and, and what you can do to uh, to prepare for these. Uh, so yeah, during this talk, feel free to uh, ask any questions. So there's a ask questions uh, functionality in this webinar. So feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll try to cover some questions in the in the middle of the talk, those that are relevant to any particular slide. Uh, but most of the questions we'll, we'll take at the end, right? So we'll have a Q and A session towards the end. Uh, so our agenda today is going to be, uh, we're going to start with uh, some misconceptions about system design, right? So now system design is, uh, is, is the thing we notice is it's really fraught with misconceptions uh, because it is so open-ended uh, compared to the algorithms interview. People tend to think that, you know, algorithms rules apply there, right? Which is just not true. System design is a, is a completely different ball game. And so, uh, after that, we'll, we'll talk about approaching the interview, right? And again, the approach for system design is very different from the approach for algorithms. Um, and similar, uh, on a similar note, we'll talk about approaching your preparation, right? Uh, your, your preparation should also be very different than uh, what you do for the algorithms interview. So at the end of uh, the talk, I'll give you a, a framework for high-level design. So I'll give you a diagram, essentially, which you can kind of use to pretty much uh, pretty much spec out most high-level designs in system design interviews. Right? So it's going to be it's going to be a standard design for web backends, uh, which you can kind of pretty much reuse in most of these interviews. So at the end, we'll give you that. So there's two stars. You'll see we have two stars pointed out here. Uh, the first star is on the misconceptions, uh, sorry, misconceptions uh, point. Uh, so these are these are stars, uh, these are points that are essentially the most important, right? So the misconceptions part is very important because uh, you know if you don't have these clear, it can lead you to uh, a wrong path in the interview, which would really cost you. Uh, and the high-level design framework is just pretty pretty useful because you can use it in most of your interviews. All right, so let's get started. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them in the uh, in the questions uh, feature. I'll, I'll try to take as many questions as possible during the talk, questions that are relevant, and then of course we'll have a Q and A. So I'll try to keep this talk between half an hour to forty five minutes, um, and and uh, we'll try to do more Q and A towards the end. Right? So let me talk about misconceptions now, and there's a reason why I've put a picture of um, a person stepping on this chewing gum or paint or whatever, right? Because in a system design interview, uh, if you if you fall into one of these traps, what happens is uh, you you're going to start going down a path that's going to take you down uh, that's not going to benefit you, right? And so it's one of those things where you're going to waste even if you waste five or ten minutes, that's really precious time you have wasted, right? Let's take a look at our misconceptions now. So before that. You know, these are examples of system design questions, like your typical system design questions that you'll get. Uh, you know, these are you know some of the most common questions. You know, design Facebook, uh, design WhatsApp, uh, Uber, Lyft, designing a load balancer, uh, databases, URL shorteners, things like that. So one thing you'll notice is that there's uh, you know roughly two or three categories of system design questions. Uh, the first category is you'll see the top three questions here is you know design a product right so a product that everyone has used they'll ask you to design that the second category is uh, some back-end system right so you, the last three questions here 
are uh, backend systems that 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 are pretty general generally used in most backends, right? Like a load balancer. Uh, so so watch out, prepare for both these categories, right? One mistake I see people do is uh, just preparing for a products uh, like how product how you design a particular product, right? Uh, so be careful with that. All right, so. Let's talk about our first misconception. So the first misconception is, and it's very common, is that system design interviews have a fixed format. Uh, that's just not true at all. Um, every interviewer has their own things that they're looking for. Uh, and typically, uh, the best indication that a system design interview is going well is if it's if you think that it's it's becoming a conversation right if the interviewer is engaged if they're asking you questions you're answering them if you're having a conversation that's typically a good sign that it's going well now this is very different from algorithms right in algorithms you're doing most of the talking right in system design it's very different uh, and so if if you see a lot of online products or online courses that show you a specific format like the people try to do all these blog posts with a specific format of system design um, don't fall under the trap that you know the format will be fixed right uh, that's just one format that they're they're showing um, yeah, there's a good question here someone's asking should i ask immediately uh, should I ask the interviewer immediately about what your assumptions are um, yeah, that's a good question. We'll get to it in a minute. Yeah, thanks for asking the questions, by the way. Keep, uh, you know, just keep the questions coming. So the second misconception is, uh, again, a very common mistake we see is listing a lot of features, right? When, when someone asks you to implement Facebook, right, um, one instinct that candidates have, and it's, it's, it's really an instinct because we see them just do this intuitively, is to, like, list a bunch of features you know like oh let's have a recommendation let's have um inter let's have like a, a intelligent uh recommendation algorithms for newsfeed let's have likes let's have comments uh, let's have um, your home feed and things like that so um that's that's really a pitfall you shouldn't fall into that trap because that's Usually, that's not what the interviewer is looking for, right? The interviewer is not looking to see if you you can come up with features. They're trying to net, they're trying to see if you can design a system, and the best way to design a fist system is to narrow down the features and design for those feature set, right? And what what you'll see is most interviewers are actually looking for that. So instead of instead of listing a bunch of features. Uh, tell the interviewer that you know we'll start off with a small list of features, uh, and uh, and and if if we want we can add more features later. But a small feature set will help us design uh, the system in the short amount of time, right? You can tell the interviewer that, uh, and 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 usually they're they're totally okay with that. Um, so the third misconception is if you're asked to design, let's say again Facebook. Um, there's a common misconception that you're being asked to design the front end or the UI. Uh, generally, that's not the case. Generally, people are um, asking to design the back end, right? If you're applying for a generalist position, typically your system design questions are about the back end, right? Now, again, you should uh, clarify all of these things with your interviewer, right? The golden rule of system design is before you start doing anything, uh, confirm with the interviewer, and you don't need a verbal confirmation from the interviewer, just tell the interviewer what you're about to do, right? So if you go back to the previous point, listing a lot of features, before you start listing a feature, tell the interviewer, I'm gonna list a small set of features, the essential features of this product, and we, so that we can design for that, right? And that gives an interviewer uh, an indication of what's to come, right? So if they're expecting something different, they can correct you and say, hey, okay, that's not what I'm expecting, please uh, start with uh, this kind of feature, right? Similarly here, if you're, um, if you're confused about if you should design a UI or design the backend, then you should, uh, you should start by telling the interviewer, you know, I'm assuming that we wanna design the backend, 
And if that's not the case, they'll 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 change and, and ask you to uh, do something different, right? Uh, uh, ask you whatever they're expecting you to. Now, there's a caveat here. Um, for if you're interviewing for a front-end specific role or a mobile role, then um, they might be asking you to design the UI and design the web application or the mobile application, right? So be be wary of that, right? Uh, well, typically, when we talk about system design right now, we're talking about your generalist interview, uh, which which is back-end specific, right? And by the way, even if you're applying for a front-end role or a mobile role, um, you're often asked about uh, the back end, right? Instead of, uh, instead of just the front end. So, so make sure you clarify that with the interviewer. Uh, this is another very big misconception, which is, you know, I should have worked on scalable systems before uh, that, uh, you know, I, in my current job, I'm only using uh, my company's APIs and I've never worked on scaling a system before, so that gives me a disadvantage in the interview. Uh, what you'll see is that even at these top companies, like you know, take a look at your your you know so-called dream companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon. Um, most engineers, I would you know, I would guess more than 95% of the engineers are not working on scaling systems directly, right? They're using their internal APIs and things like that. So. Um, this is something that people are often confused about. So uh, you don't you don't need to have worked on these systems before, but uh, you do need uh, knowledge of the of how to scale a system, right? That's kind of become a standard in system design, and we'll get into that in a bit. So again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask any question in the uh, questions feature, right? Uh, if any questions about the existing slides? Um, yeah, there's a good question here. So how do they know if my answer is correct and up to their expectation if they haven't uh, designed these systems or scale systems themselves? And that's a really good question. And again, that's uh, I'm glad you asked this question. So uh, there is no correct answer in a system design interview. Right? But what an interviewer is looking for is trying to see if you can design a system yourself. If you can uh, design a system from scratch, if you can take a look at what trade-offs there are with a system, uh, you can, if you can, uh, you know, change the system if the requirements change, uh, and so that's something that they they're expecting you uh, to demonstrate in this interview, right? So there's no correct answer for any interview. Um, so let's see, should we choose to do Vertical scaling or horizontal scaling? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me get to these questions after that. So I'll right now take the questions that are relevant to these slides. Um, so there's another question. Should I ask them immediately about what their assumption are for system design? Uh, yes, so you can ask the interviewer right away. Uh, so here's, here's a misconception about that, right? I should start designing a system right away. So before you start designing a system, you need to figure out what the system is, right? So what we recommend is you narrow down the system as much as possible, right? By discussing it with the interviewer. Now, uh, you know, the question you asked is, should I ask the interviewer about their assumptions? So, and that's a good question, right? Um, you know, should you ask the interviewer, hey, what are the assumptions with the system? So typically, in a, when an interviewer is is coming into an interview, right, um, they're expecting a candidate to suggest uh, assumptions and confirm it with the interviewer. Uh, they're not they're not looking typically to give you the exact requirements, right? And so what we typically suggest candidates do is 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 employ a suggestive approach where you suggest an assumption uh, to the interviewer. Uh, that they can approve, right? That's it's that makes the job easy for the interviewer, right? So the less and it also makes the job great for you because you're leading the interview in the direction you want, right? So here's an example. So let's say that uh, you design a a database. Let's say you have a database in your system, right? Instead of asking, you know, what are the data requirements for this database or what are the user requirements, you can ask them. You know, can we assume that you know we want to scale to millions of users, 
right? And typically the interviewer will say, yes, you can assume that, right? But that gives you control of the interview because you're uh, suggesting something uh, which you've already prepared, right? So you, if you've prepared how to scale a database to millions of users, then by you're, you're, you're kind of um, moving the interview in your odds, right? You're, you're putting odds in your favor because uh, you're suggesting something that you already know very well, so you can demonstrate your skills. And so we, we suggest doing a suggestive approach instead of just asking the interviewer uh, what to do, okay? Uh, here's another misconception about system design interviews. Uh, you know, why would I design a distributed database from scratch? Why can I just you know why can't I just use MongoDB, right? So um, that's a you know that's a lot that's a, something that uh, people struggle with. And the key here is to really change your mindset about what a system design interview is about, right? If the system design interview is not about uh, you know, if you're on the job you know, at, a, at a startup and they're asking you to build the system, that's not what it's about, right? Because, you know, if you were in your real job, you would, you would use third-party systems, right? You would find MongoDB and you would use it. You wouldn't design a database from scratch. But that's not what a system design interview is about. And this is a key uh, to changing your mindset, right? The system design interview is trying to test if you can design these systems or any system from scratch, right? It's not trying to test if you can use a system, right? Using versus designing, those are two different things. Excuse me, yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's the, those are two different things and you should keep that in mind, right? Which is another reason why uh, we suggest students that you don't need to use a particular brand of database, right? You can, uh, and you also don't need to know all the different brands of databases or all the different brands of subsystems, right? Uh, as long as you know uh, the category, like, so you can tell the interviewer, I'll use a distributed database here, right? Um, you don't need to know specific uh, brands, right? Because that becomes a knowledge-based interview instead of a system design interview. <coughs> I'm sorry, right? Uh, so the sub second, the next misconception is you know, again, it's a test. I cannot ask the interviewer much, uh, which is just not true. It's supposed to be a discussion with the interviewer. Uh, we've gone with that before. Um, another misconception is I don't need to prepare anything, right? It's something that you can't prepare for. And that's not true, especially in the past two or three years. Uh, system design interviews have become more and more standardized. Um, and if you go online, you'll see that, you know, things like horizontal scaling, sharding, uh, consistent hashing, these have become uh, things that you should know in for system design interviews, right? So there's this base knowledge about distributed systems and how a good backend works that you should know in system design interviews, right? So there is things to prepare now, and we'll go over preparation in a bit. So let's talk about approaching the interview. Okay, so uh, how do you approach a system design interview? And again, you know, this is gonna uh, vary a lot, right? Because different interviewers will want different things, right? It's a conversation, so there's really no uh, fixed format. And so what we suggest students is to start with an approach uh, and then and then be flexible and uh, whatever the interviewer, wherever the interviewer leads you, go in that direction, right? But there's one standard thing we recommend in most system design interviews. Your goal should be uh, to get to the first diagram as soon as possible, right? And the reason is that uh, un until you put diagrams on the whiteboard, the, there is nothing concrete you've proposed, right? So in the back of your head, uh, you know, the goal should be to get to the first diagram uh, as soon as possible because then you put something concrete out there. And that's really when the system design interview truly starts because that's when the interviewer can kind of critique your design and really look at the design and maybe ask you questions about it, ask you to modify it, things like that, right? So always keep this in mind. You wanna, you wanna have something concrete on the whiteboard. So we, we recommend a five-step approach in our bootcamp. Um, and again, this is very, uh, you know, a lot, most of the time the interviewer will 
uh, kind of not even let you finish all these approaches. But we recommend starting with this approach and then kind of seeing where the interviewer leads you, right? And also the key is to make each step quick, right? Uh, before you propose a design, your requirements step, you want to optimize so that gathering requirements is quick, right? Uh, because you want to spend as much time on the design uh, as possible, right? Uh, and again, before before you start each step, tell the interviewer what you're doing so they have the chance to uh, to change or correct you if that's not what they're expecting. Okay, so let's take a couple of questions uh, that were related to things we've talked about. Um, so there's one about, um, can I use a third party library as a component in the design? You know, you typically can um, if it's not what they're asking you to implement, right? So if you're asking you to implement a scalable distributed distributed database, then you know you cannot use that, right? But you could probably use something like um, uh, like a third party library to support your design. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So so step one, we have a five step approach. It's called the first approach, F U S H D. And uh, and so the first step is is features. We recommend you define two to four core features uh, of your of your of the product, right? And this is for mostly for user-facing products, right? This is really key because uh, this really narrows down the system. The more features you have, the more complexity you have, and because you have limited time, the harder time you have uh, going deeper because you have to define all these different features and, and plan plan out your system, right? So narrow down. So an example here is if you're designing a messaging backend like WhatsApp, then here's a really simple system about WhatsApp, right? You just send and receive messages between two devices, right? Just one-on-one -on -one conversations, no group messages. Uh, and then there's a simple uh, screen that the user will have, which will just list all their chats and, and no images and video. So a simple chat app, right? Uh, so you've really narrowed things down and you've gotten rid of things like, you know, has the user seen a message or, uh, you know, other complexities, right? So the first step is narrowing down your feature set. Second step is use cases, right? So once you've narrowed down your features, you kind of want to solidify them into, uh, you know, when you want to make it more specific, right? So one really good way for user-facing uh, products is to design a simple wireframe, right? A very simple wireframe, like the one we've done here. Uh, you'll see that it's it's really simple, and it it tells the interviewer exactly what you're implementing, right? So you'll see that they have, they have a conversations list. And then when a user clicks on a conversation, then uh, they go to a chat and, and and there's a chat screen. That's it. That's a really simple system. Uh, if, you've, if you've specified this, then like you exactly know what you need to do, right? You've kind of entered a contract with the interviewer early on that, hey, this is what we're defining, uh, designing and we don't need to worry about anything else, right? And that's really powerful because now you can, you can just implement a backend just for this, right? So uh, the third step we recommend doing, and again, this is going to vary uh, for, for systems. So for a user-facing system, uh, this makes sense, which is uh, kind of do a rough draft of your database schema. And this really helps later on. Um, and you don't need to define an exact schema. I think there's a misconception there that in system design interviews, you need uh, some like uh, you know, exact database schema format. That's not the case. Usually it's pretty open-ended. So an example here is, your um, your messaging application will have a user, as you can see here, and they'll have um, and a user will have an ID, a password, profile pic, and a list of unread messages. Right, a really simple. And a message can have you know a sender, a receiver, you know the text and a timestamp. Right, uh, and then you can also have a conversations table where uh, you know you have conversations between two users. Right. So uh, this rough draft really helps you later on because you know exactly what what data you're working on, so you can you can kind of visualize the interactions really easily. So the fourth step is high level design, right? So the first three steps, uh, you've really defined your system, right? You've you know exactly where you're going to implement. You even know what data you need to work on. So at this point, you can pretty much uh, spec out a high level design for the system, right? 
And the high-level design for a backend is typically very standard. Uh, you have you can find templates online. We have a template that we use, and we'll we'll get to this at the end. But yeah, you can use a standard template for designing a backend. Uh, and then step five is detailed design. So once you propose a high-level design, um, that means first of all, if you propose a high-level design and the interviewer understands it, you're doing really well anyway, right? Uh, hopefully you've done that. Hopefully you're not running out of time. Uh, if you if you do that, you're doing pretty well. And so now the real meat of the conversation uh, can be can happen, which is a detailed design, right? So now the interviewer can can do one of three things typically dive deeper into a subsystem so they'll say okay so you've put a cache in here uh, tell me tell me more about the cache how will you scale a cache what all will you put in the cache right that's a common question uh, second thing you could do is get deeper into a feature right so you know receiving a message you know typically the interviewer will point out some some use case or something um, where some edge cases like how would you handle this case right uh, an example of this one would be, you know, you know, you're receiving messages. How would you handle uh, if the if the uh, the receiver is offline, right? Uh, how, what would you do in that case? And the third one, which is less common typically, is adding more features. Uh, so let's say you want to add group chats. How would you, you know, extend your system to add group chats, for example, right? Uh, so these typically are these are the three directions uh, interviewers can go into. So, uh, so that was the approach that we highlighted, right? Again, the five steps, uh, the FU SHD approach. And, we'll, and there's questions here about sharing the PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll find a way to share the PowerPoint with, with folks on the call, yeah. All right, um, so the, the next thing we wanna talk about is approaching your preparation. Right? Um, there's a couple things you wanna note here. Um, actually, there's a, let's see, there's a good question here. Um, uh, there's a good question here, which is in, in our steps, we said that these steps should be completed quickly. Um, yeah, so, so the first three steps are the ones that need to be completed quickly. So features, uh, uh, use cases, what to store, those are the ones you wanna complete quickly. The high level design and the detailed design those are you can take your time right because that is the meat that is uh, what the interview is all about so 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 those those things you can kind of take your time and have discussions with the interviewer right uh, the first three steps are the ones you want to overcome because that's that's kind of blocking you from define from the system design part yeah that's a really good question uh, there's another good question here uh, do we have to write pseudocode in a system design interview? Uh, it depends. Uh, sometimes the interviewer will ask you to write some pseudocode. Um, and yeah, so sometimes you do have to write pseudocode in a system design interview. Yep. All right. So approaching your prep, um, how do you prepare for these interviews? So there's a couple tips that are, that are key. The first thing to note is that system design takes less time to prepare than algorithms, right? And there's a very... Um, very obvious reason for that. For algorithm interviews, there's a lot of practice needed, right? So you, you have to practice coding. Uh, you have, there's a lot of topics. You have to practice a lot of problems. That takes a lot more time. With system design, uh, once you know something, once you know how these systems work, how do you design a system, um, you know, you, you're kind of done. You don't need to practice things again and again. You don't need to go over a thousand problems. Uh, no one should go over a thousand problems anyway for algorithms, uh, but system design takes a lot less time typically than algorithm interviews. Um, so yeah, one one uh, again one pitfall people fall into is they get misled by websites that give you some structure for a system design interview, and they claim that you know they claim that that is a structure people follow, but that might not be the case. Right? Usually, it's not the case. So treat your preparation as growing your knowledge base. Don't treat it as trying to crack a specific format, right? So grow your knowledge base. Um, the second tip I recommend people do, a lot of people don't do this. Uh, honestly, most people don't do this, but I think it really helps is to read a few of these key research papers, right? They, they really show you 
how you design and scale a system, what you think about while designing a system. Now you shouldn't read, you shouldn't get into a habit of reading research papers because they're too complicated for interviews, but there's three research papers I typically recommend people read, um, and they are listed here, right? Uh, MapReduce, the original Google search paper, and Facebook Haystack. These are beginner-friendly papers, uh, and uh, especially the Google search paper, like the first few pages are good enough. You don't need to read the entire entire paper, right? Because it goes into needless details. And so, uh, especially with reading any paper for interviews, you know, start reading it, and then once it seems too complicated, just stop. You don't probably don't need that info. Um, and the third tip is no sharding really well, right? Sharding is uh, the the Swiss Army knife of scaling things. Pretty much scaling anything horizontally um, will 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 use sharding, right? And the, there's different kinds of sharding. And so uh, you know, research it, learn it, know it really well, know how to apply it really well because it'll be really useful. So there's a question here. Uh, is there any links for these papers? Uh, we don't have links here, but you can just Google search them. There's, uh, you know, these are pretty standard papers. You'll find them uh, for free. You'll find PDFs for free online. Um, yeah. So there's a question here. Uh, are the first two steps, okay, well, this question about the steps that we defined before as well. I'll handle that. Well, let's, let's handle that afterwards. Okay, so so that was about preparing uh, for the interviews. So so now I'll before we get into Q and A, um, we'll talk about the high level system design template that we have. Right now, this is a standard design that you can use for most backends. Right. In fact, if your backend doesn't have one of these components, then you should really question why, right? Because these components are extremely standard. Um, if you don't mention this in an interview, a lot of times it's considered uh, not good, right? Uh, for example, the cache. Uh, so let me first you know, describe the system, and then we can we can talk about you know uh, the tips for for bringing these things up. So you have a client here. Right. Uh, let's say you're designing Facebook. This is your client, uh, and this is where your backend starts. Right. Your backend should always have a load balancer uh, because uh, uh, that should be the gateway to your backend. Right. You don't want to expose your app servers directly to the internet right, or directly to clients. The load balancer, even though the name says load balancer, which means balancing load. Uh, it's also used nowadays as uh, just as a security, kind of like a security firewall kind of a server, right? It's it's your gateway, so it protects you from um, you know bad requests and from the public accessing your your servers. And so a load balancer is really critical. And then so your API request comes in, right? And it go, so there's a question here: do do we have a single load balancer or multiple load balancers? So if, typically, uh, load balancer itself is distributed, right? So you'll have multiple machines uh, that serve as, as load balancer, right? You don't want to load, you don't want one machine to be a single point of failure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so here's a good, another good question, which is, uh, do we need to know about specific tools and frameworks uh, for these interviews? Uh, for example, uh, Zookeeper. Uh, so you don't need to know specific tools and frameworks. So uh, you don't need to know them. That's a short answer. But have them just just know if, know the names of a few of them, uh, just so you can uh, just in case the interviewer asks you like you know can you give examples of such a system. But yeah, typically you don't need to know about any specific tools. So you have a load balancer, and then and then the app servers or web servers. You know the name keeps changing. Uh, this these handle the request right so for example let's say you're you're getting a request to let's say you're updating your profile picture right uh, your app server will will get that request and then you know your profile picture is probably let's say it's in your user table in your database database so the app server will then uh, tell the database to uh, update the profile picture of this particular user right uh, and so they will, you know, they will know. They will. The database will update, and 
and pretty much that's it for this for this particular request, right? So the app server will then return a response saying, "Hey, you're, you know, true or whatever. You know, it's been a success." And that's that's uh, that's it for the flow of that particular request, right? Um, so, so that was a simple request, but let's go to a little more um, a different request. Let's say the user requested a let's say that they saw a popular post on Facebook and they requested, they clicked on it and they requested the details, right? So popular posts are usually requested by many users. So they're good candidates to, to put in your cache, right? So your memcache here is, is a very standard component in pretty much all backends nowadays. Uh, if you've used Redis before, Redis is used as a memcache as well as a, as a cache. Uh, so the reason we use a cache is because, and this is something key to know if you don't know it, uh, you know, cache reads from main memory, right? Cache reads from your, your RAM, whereas databases read from disk, right? And RAM is much faster than disk, uh, you know, at least 100 times faster than disk. And don't quote me on that. I think the number is around 100 or 200 times, something like that. Uh, so reading something from a cache is, is, is much faster. And so uh, things that are popular, we always want to put them in cache, right? And so uh, it's a common optimization you can do in your backend. Uh, one of the first ones you always bring up, right? So popular like celebrity profiles, popular posts, um, things like uh, you know if you have a homepage, those should always be cached because a lot of users will access them, and you don't want to fetch them again and again from the database, right? So the cache is a very critical component. Uh, the next component is a job queue. That's another very critical component, right? So let's take an example. So let's say that a user liked a profile picture or something, liked a picture, right? Uh, you know, you don't need to do the actual processing of the like in order to update the like icon for the user, right? You can just take the, you can just register the like request and you can just instantly send true to the user, right? It's not something critical. You don't need to wait for the actual like to get processed, right? And then you can offload that like to a job queue where it gets processed, not instantly, right? But you know, maybe in a few seconds, maybe in a few minutes, that's okay. You sent a success response to the user so the user can immediately update the UI, right? And that's, that's much better user experience instead of waiting for like three seconds for your like to be processed, right? And so the tasks that are not critical to the user, you can offload them, right? You can you can offload them uh, and have them uh, execute asynchronously. And so that's a really important toolbox. Um, anything that's not critical for the user right away, you can offload that to a job queue and that dramatically increases, uh, no, sorry, decreases your uh, response time, right? Your request becomes much faster. So that's another optimization you can you always need to have in a backend. Um, so let's see. Um, there's another question here. What is the optimal size of your cache? Right. So the cache. The reason that you know you don't just store everything in your cache is because, uh, uh, well, for one, main memory is expensive, but also you want like you don't want to store everything in your cache because cache is not persistent storage. Right. Databases is persistent storage. So uh, the size of the cache is what really determines how much you can store, right? And the size just depends on your budget, right? So ideally, you know, you can have as much cash as possible. And so uh, there's no optimal size pretty much, right? It's, it's whatever you can afford. Uh, there's another question here. Are we caching database queries in memcache um, or or get API responses. I guess I don't know what you mean by that, but yes, you can also query, cache popular database queries in, in the cache. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. So, all right, so the next um, component here, which we have is uh, a CDN. Right, so CDN. So this is this will depend on your system. A lot of systems don't need a CDN, right? But if you're pretty much, if you're the rule of thumb is, if you have images or videos, uh, use a CDN to to cache them. Right. So what a CDN for those of you who are not familiar, what what CDN does, uh, 
is that it uh, typically these are third-party providers. They have they have servers spread out all over the world. So um, so if you're requesting, let's say, um, a video, then uh, a CDN will will find a server that's close to your geographic location and serve the video from there, right? So a CDN distributes content uh, on different servers all around the world, so that you can find uh, a server close by, right? And and so CDNs and they're only used for uh, images, typically images and videos, anything that's static, right? Anything that doesn't need the server to intervene, right? Uh, so like static web pages sometimes, uh, images and videos are what they're used for. Uh, anything that doesn't need uh, interaction with your app server, and so those requests don't even hit your backend. Right? Typically, uh, the CDN providers are third party. Like if you've heard of uh, Akamai, I think it's Akamai is a, one of the most popular CDN providers. Um, so, so basically, what Facebook will do is, uh, you know, send Akamai this video, a popular video, to cache, and then Akamai will distribute it across their servers around the world, and so. Next time you request that Facebook video, or anyone in the world requests that Facebook video, it will be processed from somewhere nearby, hopefully. Right. Um, yeah, there's another question here about cache, which is what do you do if a cache is full, right? And that's that's yeah, that's a good question. Typically, that 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 you're asked in system design interviews, what is your cache eviction strategy, right? And so you have to figure out uh, what the, the strategy is. So one way to do this would be like if you if you do a least recently used strategy, then you know data that's used uh, that, that hasn't been used recently that gets evicted to to accommodate for fresher data, right? There's all kinds of caching strategies out there. Yeah, but yeah, least recently used is the most uh, popular one for interviews, I think. All right. So the question is, how do we query CDN? So typically, CDN links are different. Uh, they're provided by the CDN provider. And so if you look at, typically, if you look at your Facebook videos, there's a good chance the link is not like a facebook.com slash V link. Uh, there's a good chance it's a CDN specific link, a third party link. Um, so so those are, they, they go directly to the CDN, CDN servers. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, any any questions about this particular system, right? Uh, it, it should be hopefully easy to understand. It's something you should really uh, know at the tip of your fingers before going into an interview, right? Because you can pretty much tweak this diagram for, for most systems, right? Unless, uh, like most products uh, that, that they ask your design a backend for, you can pretty much tweak this diagram and, and, and use it for those, uh, for, for most questions, yeah. Um, so there's a question like, what are these workers doing? So these workers are essentially, uh, you know, these are just machines that are you know, picking up tasks from the job queue and processing them. Uh, so these are just, this will be like a, typically it's like a cluster of machines that their sole job is to process asynchronous tasks, right? Uh, the app server is, is there for synchronous tasks typically, right? The, you know, API requests uh, are handled by app servers. Okay. Um, so, so there's another. So there's a question here. Idea for systems which need big data processing. I guess I don't understand exactly, but but that that reminds me of another segue, which is there's another class of system design problems that are related to data processing. How do you process uh, this large amount of data? Design a system to process this large amount of data. Um, and that's kind of out of scope for today's talk, but uh, if you if you if you notice before, I recommended you read the the MapReduce paper, right? Uh, the, the, the MapReduce paper. Uh, that's a very standard system uh, that you can use to pretty much do large data processing, right? Uh, it's a very classic system, right? But it's uh, for interviews, you can pretty much directly apply it to do a lot of big data processing. So I highly recommend that you read the MapReduce paper, right? It's not, it's not super complicated. It's, it's uh, once you understand it, you kind of uh, 
get get how to scale uh, big data processing stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's now uh, do Q and A. Uh, so yeah, if you if you want to uh, reach us, you can reach us at interviewcamp.io. That's our that's our bootcamp, uh, or you can email us at team at interviewcamp.io. Um, yeah, so let's do Q and A. Let's see what's what questions do we have now. Um, so there's a question here. Uh, so there's a general, yeah, so there's a general question about should we use NoSQL or relational database? And that's another very very popular issue that people have, right? Like, should I use NoSQL or should I use like MySQL or, or SQL? And um, the short answer is both are good, right? There's no right, there's no, um, the industry is divided between those two, right? And there's no right answer. So some people use, some companies will, will use SQL, some companies will use NoSQL. The answer that I typically recommend for interviews um, is, is start off with whatever you're comfortable with, right? So, so I typically start off, I recommend people to start off with NoSQL systems and tell the interviewer that for this distributed database, we can use a NoSQL database because it's scalable out of the box. And so it can handle our scale out of the box. Um, now, you'll notice in that sentence, there's a few key things. I said we can use, right? I didn't say we should use. And so when it comes to NoSQL versus SQL, uh, don't be opinionated, right? Be open to suggestions. And so uh, you can say we can use a NoSQL database. It's hard, it's scalable right out of, out of the box and uh, it will suit, our, suit this uh, use case pretty well, right? There's a benefit to uh, starting with NoSQL databases. NoSQL databases are, as I said, scalable out of the box. So you can get into discussions about sharding and consistent hashing which is a really good technically deep discussion to have, right? Uh, you know, SQL databases can also be distributed horizontally using sharding, but typically, you know, companies have to implement those, uh, implement custom solutions for those, right? Uh, most SQL databases, uh, they're not as scalable out of the box, right? You have to customize them, uh, split them up, and, and implement your own sharding. Uh, so, so I typically tell people to start off with NoSQL databases. But again, it, it really depends. You have to be flexible, right? Sometimes the interviewer might be opinionated towards SQL, and so you have to accommodate that uh, that opinion, right? So, so yeah, be be open minded when it comes to SQL versus no SQL. Um, the question is: Can you explain the relation between workers and message queue? So the job queue is a queue that just um, registers jobs and hands them off to workers, right? Workers are the ones that actually do the process each job. So for example, let's say you're liking a profile picture, or liking a picture, right? The job queue will just have information for that job. User A liked this particular picture, right? The worker will pick up that job and they'll actually update the database to like uh, to process that like and update the database. Right? So job queue doesn't do any processing. It's a queue, right? So it just has the job and it hands it off to these workers as and when they become available. Right. So that's a, that's, that's a relation between them. Um, so, so I've answered about you know, which distributed databases to use. Uh, someone asked about, there's a popular question about consistent hashing. Um, is this related to today's talk? Well, so consistent hashing, can be brought up when talking about how do you scale a database, right? Typically, uh, in, in the detailed design, the interviewer can ask you, okay, how do you scale a database horizontally, right? How do you add more machines? What happens when the data grows? And consistent hashing is one of those ways, it comes under sharding, and so it's one of those ways you can, you can shard data, right? So that's consistent. So when I talk, when I say sharding, you know, consistent hashing is, is one of those ways to do it. Um, let's see what else is here. Let's see what the questions do we have? So the question about what are some system design questions for 
uh, special roles like compiler engineer. So like for specific roles, uh, you know, system design questions tend to be very knowledge based. And so, they, uh, you know, those questions tend to, so for example, I'll give you an example, right? Um, mobile, let's take like Android development. Um, for Android developer roles, if they're asking, a, if there's a design interview specific to Android, they'll they'll try to make sure you know the latest Android uh, paradigms, right? Um, or like uh, like, or they'll give you a situation that you have this app and it's consuming a lot of memory. Uh, how will you diagnose it and what steps will you take, right? Which is kind of you need to know the particular uh, technology and and uh, and it's more knowledge based than your general system design interview. So it's so so it's, there's no specific format for that, right? So I, I really have no answer about um, if there's a format for that. Right. So let's see. Um, what other question do we have here? Uh, do we need to know UML or different diagrams for showing design or just the framework diagram? So UML is typically used for object relations, right? The relationship between one object to the other. Typically, you don't need to know UML for system design interviews. That's the short answer. Uh, yeah, you really don't. Uh, yeah, I guess that's the answer. <laughs> um, What kind of questions do they ask regarding sharding? Uh, so if you if you learn, there's really three types of sharding, broadly speaking: static sharding, dynamic sharding, and consistent hashing. Right, and you should know how each of those works. And so really, they'll ask you how do you shard something, and you just tell them how do you shard. Right, and then there'll be follow-up questions like, you know, what if one machine goes down? How will your sharded system handle that? How will you handle replication? Things like that. So typically, um, if you know uh, sharding, they, uh, it's like a standard thing. Things they ask, right? It's just the sharding knowledge. Uh, so if you prepare for sharding, those are the questions they'll be asked. Uh, there's a question about if we have an in-memory database, can that be treated as memcache? Yeah, so you know, in-memory database and memcache are often treated interchangeably. The only difference between you know a memcache and an in-memory database is that an in-memory database is also a database, which means it backs up to its hard drive, right? Uh, a cache is only like a memcache is only storing in the RAM. So as soon as a machine goes down or it's, it's, for some reason, some power outage happens, then that data is gone, right? Whereas in an in-memory database, you're also backing it up on the hard drive. Um, so yeah, you can use an in-memory database interchangeably with a cache, right? Yep, yep. Uh, let's see what other questions do we have here. Um, Yeah, there's a question here that's pretty good, um, which is, let's say you have an e-commerce store and uh, users are trying to purchase a specific uh, item which has limited items in stock and then you know, a lot of people might try to process them parallelly. Um, you know, how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? It's handled well. So I would recommend you look at something called uh, transaction processing. Uh, that's another thing, by the way, that you should know it for system design interviews is transaction processing. It's its own category of it's its own uh, um, like category. It's a, it's a pattern of of uh, committing something, right? And so usually these things go through something called a two-phase commit. Uh, so yeah, look up transaction processing. So it, most things that need uh, like things that uh, need to be that have like limits supply, for example purchasing an item that has limited supply, uh, those are typically called transactions. And so those are typically handled by uh, you know, MySQL databases or databases that have transaction processing built in. Um, so yeah, just, just look that up, yeah. Uh, otherwise, if, 
you know, typically you just look it up online and, and look up two-phase commit, you'll get details about transactions. All right. Um, let's see, let me go up to some earlier questions and see if there's anything. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? So, in general, we all, this is a good question. So, in general, we all come from uh, specific backgrounds, either UI, middleware, some programming, business logics, database, networking. Um, in a system design interview, do we need to have, do we need to know all these fields? So, typically, a system design interview is very generic. Um, you don't need to know, the, I think you don't need to know, have like, deep knowledge of like networking, for example, right? You need to know like the basics of networking. Um, but you, uh, I think I think it's less knowledge base and that's the key. System design is less about knowledge, more about um, data processing, um, handling load, uh, how do you optimize um, request times, response times, which is its own field in itself, to be honest, right? Um, for uh, system design interviews is, is almost like its own field. Um, so it, it doesn't really fall into any of those categories. It's not, you know, middleware, database at work, like it's, it's, those are their own fields as well, right? So uh, it's a completely different ballgame. Is there a good way to develop basic hands-on experience with system design? Um, basic hands-on experience. So you can, if you implement a website from scratch or a web service from scratch, which means you don't use, um, like you don't use AWS, you don't use anything, you, you theoretically, you can develop hands-on experience. But I think for interviews, that would be overkill and that would be, um, that wouldn't be like the best use of your time uh, because you can, you can pretty much study these things and, and get good at them much faster than you would spend time um, implementing them, right? So that's, a, that's an interesting point you bring up, right? So maybe in the early 2000s, I would say, uh, maybe even later 2000s, people, you had to do these things. Um, if, if you were to start a website in early 2000 and, and, and it grew, right? Which means you were starting to see a lot of users you had to implement all these things yourself, right? So you had to find a caching software and implement and put it on there on a server. Uh, you had to you know, make your, get a job queue software, customize it, put it on, your, on another server or on the same server or whatever. Um, so those were the times when you had to do all these things yourself. Nowadays, you know, AWS, Google Cloud, they handle that for you. So uh, there's less hands-on uh, experience that people get with these things typically, yeah. Uh, there's a question here. Do we need to know about design patterns? Uh, so by design patterns, do you mean like object-oriented design patterns or what kind of design patterns do you mean? So yeah, let's feel free to respond to that. If you mean like object design patterns, um, you don't need to know too many design patterns. Like for example, singleton uh, is a design pattern, right? Uh, you need to know the key ones. The ones I recommend people know is usually singleton, factory, um, and I'm kind of forgetting right now. Singleton and factory are, are very popular ones you should know. But uh, in an interview, you don't need to know that many design patterns, to be honest, because a lot of times what happens is design patterns sound, seem like over-engineering a problem, right? Um, you put some, like, let's say you put like, uh, I'm forgetting my patterns, but you try to put some adapter pattern, for example, in, a, in an interview, uh, you know, it, it really feels like over-engineering to interviewers. So yeah, don't worry about design patterns too much. Know the key ones and that's about it. Um, how long do we typically have for system design interviews? Uh, we have, typically they are 45 minutes or an hour. All right, so ask a recruiter, um, 
you know, that's another thing tip I usually share is, uh, you know, ask your recruiter uh, what kind of in interviews you will have in each round, right? Uh, sometimes interviewers, they don't give it to you up front, but you, you should ask them that. Should I expect system design questions for software developer engineer profile? Uh, I guess I'm not sure what you mean, but for, for normal software engineer positions, it, it depends on the company, right? A lot of companies do ask us and design questions for all levels of software engineers. So again, you know, confirm with the recruiter what your rounds are gonna be. But yeah, it is a pretty common to be asked these for, for software engineer profiles, yeah. Um, question here is, how long, how long does do projects reside for system design? I guess I don't, I don't understand what you mean by projects reside for system design. Uh, it's just an interview, right? So there's no project really. Um, what does it mean by REST? What do you mean by REST API? So that's something you should know, right? What is a REST API? Uh, that's one of those things you should definitely know before an interview. Right? As I, as you can just do a simple Google search and, and look that up. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so there's a couple questions here. So one is about microservices. So that's another misconception that we see is, you know, in our day jobs, we're used to dealing with microservices. And so, um, with a system design interview, you know, a first instinct might be to design different microservices. But realize one thing, right? A microservice is your is is more of an abstraction of your of your business logic, right? It's more of software. Uh, it's more like how you structure your software versus how you how your system is designed. Right? It's not really the, the system. Microservices are more are much higher level than that, right? So so microservices are very different than system design. Right. And, uh, and you can ask your interviewer that if you're confused, you know, are you expecting me to design microservices or are you expecting me to design, you know, the backend system? Because yeah, those are very different things. Um, what's the judging criteria for the system design round? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So for system design, the judging criteria is, again, it's very open-ended, just like the interview itself, right? So there's really no criteria typically. The interviewer is trying to gauge, um, you know, are you able to, uh, clarity of thought, right? That's a, that's a big thing. Can you clearly, um, you know, narrow down a system, design it, uh, and then can you look at different trade-offs uh, can you can you point out what the downside might be, what bottlenecks might be there? Um, can you communicate these concepts well? They're really trying to see if they want to work with you, right? And so, um, yeah, there's really no specific criteria. Um, it, it really ends up being um, an open-ended thing. And you know, typically, again, a good sign, as I as I've said before, is if your interviewer is involved in the interview then that's typically a sign that it's going well. Another question is, is only theoretical knowledge related to system design enough? Um, I'm assuming by theoretical knowledge, you mean uh, not having implemented these systems themselves, right? But knowing how these systems are scaled, how backends are scaled. Uh, yes, that's typically enough for system design interviews. Uh, because they're trying to see, because it's 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 like another standardized test, right? Uh, they're trying to see if you know, if you can really, uh, if you can um, think clearly and, and articulate these things and evaluate trade-offs and systems. And so, yeah, knowledge about it is good enough. I wouldn't call that theoretical knowledge. I would call that just knowledge, right? Um, uh, Question about buffered video. I guess I don't understand that. What kind of buffered video are you talking about? If you're talking about buffered video on your, um, like, how do you, where do you keep buffered video in memory? Typically, buffered video is, is on the browser, right? It's the browser store. Uh, it's like downloaded on your device. Um, 
Um, so it's yeah, not not related to the back end at all. So can you discuss normal uh, system design questions asked in companies um, like Google, Goldman Sachs, Walmart? Yeah, so um, you know, there's honestly lists uh, on there's plenty of lists online of system design questions. We showed you a few popular questions at the beginning of the talk. Um, you know, designing Facebook, designing WhatsApp, uh, design load balancer. Um, there's plenty of lists out there you can look up. Uh, and you can, and those are those are typically fine. Those are popular questions that all these companies ask. Okay, so let's take up a, a couple of last questions. We are out of time, so let's see. Um, what are some here questions? Uh, common, is there a common system design? website that gives you system design practice about system questions uh, to be honest I haven't come across any good one so I, I don't really re I haven't uh, recommended any uh, website right you can what I recommend usually is take a look at the questions online and try to design systems for it yourself yeah, maybe if you have a friend who's preparing then have them interview you or have a discussion around it Uh, there's a question here that I guess the same person has asked many times. Can we start designing in cloud native? Uh, I don't know what that means to be honest. I don't know what cloud native means. Maybe you can explain that further. Uh, this is a good question. So let's make this the last question. Um, how much, what are the security concepts one should know? Uh, so, there's some general security, uh, security concept you should know. Uh, things like encryption, uh, OAuth is another good one. Uh, how do like firewalls work? Um, how do like what DDoS attacks are? Denial, uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, we have a blog post on Interview Camp's website that does that that handles specifically uh, security considerations. So if you look at if you go to blog.interviewcamp.io, we have a post on security uh, considerations for system design interviews. So you can take a look at that. And there's, there's more information there. Um, okay, so let's take one last question before we wrap up. Okay, that's a good one. Um, how do we access slides? So I think the uh, recording is going to be posted and the slides are going to be posted as well. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to access it, but maybe we can, uh, if you go to the, uh, uh, on, uh, if you go to the Hacker Earth blog uh, on webinars, you'll see details about that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, everyone, for, for attending. Um, yeah, hopefully this was helpful and uh, kind of hopefully it helps you to clarify a lot of things about system design interviews. System design, there's not that many resources online of system design interviews and the ones that are there, um, they really don't do a very comprehensive job about it. So hopefully this was helpful and uh, hope it helps you in your interviews. So yeah, all the best with your interviews and thanks, thanks a lot for attending.